Welcome to Triple V. I'm Mike Shanklin, a show where we're dedicated towards advancing the message of a free society. Today I'm joined with a very special guest. Some of you guys might know him from his father, which I don't want that to taint his, uh, his illustrious career that he's had so far. But today I'm having Dr. David Friedman on the show. Dr. David Friedman is an economist, physicist, legal scholar, and libertarian theorist. He is known for his writings in market anarchist theory, which is the subject of his most popular book, The Machinery of Freedom, which he wrote in 1973, later to be revised over in 1989. He was authored several he has authored several other books and articles including Price Theory and Intermediate Text, which he wrote in 1986, Law's Order, uh, what economics has to do with law and why it matters, very important, and Hidden Order, the economics of everyday life and the Future Imperfect, which uh, I think is, is a, a great title. So um, David Friedman actually holds a Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry and Physics from Harvard University and a PhD in Physics uh, from the University of Chicago, though he is most known for his work in other fields, uh, mostly libertarian theorism. He is currently a professor over at, uh, of law over at St. Clara uh, University and a contributing editor for Liberty Magazine, and it is a pleasure to have you on my show, Dr. David Friedman. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, good to, good to have you on the show. Uh, I, as I always start off with most of my guests, we, we like to, because there's going to be a lot of viewers, about 30% of the people who watch this video have never actually heard of voluntarism or freedom before or might be very, very new to it. So I kind of like to ask my, uh, the, my interviewees when they come on here to explain their philosophy, maybe non-aggression principle and voluntarism, and, and, and maybe how you got to whatever you are today. All right. That sounds like a, a big order. Uh <laughs> I'm not sure there is any simple statement of moral principles that I think is correct, because if you think of any simple statement and then start looking for cases where you wouldn't believe in it, uh, it's pretty easy to find them. So if I take the non-aggression principle for a moment, it's clearly a good rule of thumb. But imagine that there was a large asteroid heading for Earth, and if it hit Earth, all life would be wiped out. And suppose by some bizarre sequence of events, you could stop the asteroid by stealing something worth a nickel from somebody who is his rightful owner. It seems to me that any reasonable person would do it, even though that clearly is initiating aggression. You're stealing something from somebody who it belongs to. So I think it makes sense, to me at least, to say that violating people's rights is wrong. But it's not the only thing in the world that matters. And that therefore, if I was in an, this imagined situation where I could get an enormous benefit in human life for a very, very small cost in rights violation, I think I would do it. And I think most people would do it, even though some of them think they wouldn't. Uh, Bill Bradford, who ran Liberty Magazine until his unfortunate death a few years ago, offered some examples to sort of make that point. One of the ones I think he originated was the one where you somehow fall out of your window on the 10th floor of an apartment building, you catch hold of a flagpole on the 9th floor, which of course belongs to your, the neighbor underneath you, and you're about to climb onto his balcony and go out when he sticks his head out and says, you do not have my permission to use either my flagpole or my balcony, let go. And I think Bill correctly predicts that very few libertarians will let go under those circumstances. So at least my view is that one that respecting rights is a value on its own. It's also a means to other values. That is, I think a libertarian society would not only have less rights violations than other societies, it would also be more attractive in a lot of other ways, that people would be less likely to get sick or die or be ignorant or be miserable or whatever. All of those things matter. Uh, sometimes I'm described inaccurately as a utilitarian. A utilitarian is somebody who thinks only human happiness matters. What I am is someone who believes that it is one of the things that matters. So that sort of would be a brief description of my philosophical position. Uh, where did I, how I got to that position, I don't know, except by thinking about hypotheticals like the one I just offered and trying to make my view of morality consistent with what I really believe. Uh, Politically speaking, I'm an anarchist. That is, I think that the ideal society would have no, or most nearly ideal society, would have no government. Uh, I don't think such a society would work in all imaginable circumstances, but I think there's quite a wide range of circumstances in which such a society would be workable. Uh, I guess 
the bits of my history that might be relevant. Uh, my position, I suppose, when I was about 15, would have been what's usually described as classical liberalism. That is, I thought that there were certain minimal functions government had to provide, roughly speaking, police courts and national defense. That's the standard list. Uh, and I also had a problem, and the problem was really a, a moral philosophy problem. And the problem was that it seemed to me that for a society to work, people had to be to feel obliged to obey the law, because there were never enough policemen to make people obey the law. But I could not see any moral reason why one was obliged to obey law if the law didn't happen to be morally correct. That is, the way I like to put it is that right and wrong are not made by act of Congress. So it seems clear to me that I have a moral obligation not to murder people whether or not it's against the law. And the question is, does passing a law against something give me an additional or a different moral reason for what to do? And my position as I when I think I was about 15 thinking about this, was that on the one hand, I couldn't see any reason why one was morally obeyed, obliged to obey laws. On the other hand, I thought it was necessary that people believe that for a society to work. So my tentative decision was that I would myself obey laws until I solved the problem, until I found a more satisfactory solution, I would act on the working assumption that I was obliged to obey them, though I wasn't sure I was. And I acted on that assumption for a few years. And then I noticed something odd, that as far as I could tell, I was the only person in the world who acted as if he thought he was morally obliged to obey laws. That if, let us say, if I got to the point where I was legally allowed to drink, for instance, and I refused to offer a glass of wine to a friend who was a year younger, because there was a minimum drinking age. Uh, or if I held my speed on the highway down to the speed limit when everybody else was going 10 miles above it. Well, it occurred to me that that was evidence against the belief I'd been working on, because I lived in a society which did function. People didn't act as if they believed they were obliged to obey the law, and the society kept functioning. And so rethinking that question, I decided what was really going on was that for a society to function, you needed some mix of government only making the right laws, the ones you were already obliged to obey, people obeying laws for prudential reasons, because they didn't want to get a speeding ticket, uh, and that that was enough uh, to give you a working society. So since then, I have not felt any moral obligation to obey laws. So that was sort of one step in my progression. The other step was going from classical liberalism to anarchy. And the critical step on that, I think, was, was a science fiction novel by Robert Heinlein, some of you have read it, uh, called The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, because that novel gave what I thought was an in internally consistent picture of a society in which the equivalent of police and courts were being produced privately rather than by government. Now, if a theorem is true, then it's always true. So that if you think in the mathematical context, a single counterexample is enough to show a theorem is false. I thought I had the equivalent of a theorem in political theory, namely that you could not provide the basic framework of police and laws uh, except by government. I had at least a consistent fictional portrayal of how it could be done, and it followed that the theorem at least had to be false. Uh, so that started me thinking about the question of how I could get the equivalent of Heinlein's fictional society in a more realistic context, in a world and a government and uh, a, a country, as it were, like the one I was actually living in. And my first book, The Machinery of Freedom, came out of that project, that I was trying to uh, imaginatively create a set of institutions that would provide the framework of courts and police and such and would not involve the government. Uh, now, discussing that would be a longer discussion. However, the book can be downloaded as a PDF for free from my web page, uh, so people who are curious can read it. It's also still in print. It's, I, in one sense, it's my most successful book. In another sense, it isn't. It has, I think, more important ideas that other people didn't have in it. So I think it's had a larger influence than my other books. My guess is that Hidden Order, which is an attempt to write a book that will teach you the equivalent of an economics course for fun, that will essentially let you read a book that's enjoyable to read and end up knowing at least as much economics as you would after a semester or two of econ, uh, 
I think has probably sold more copies than, than, than machinery, though I don't have a very exact count of either. Uh, but probably had a, a less, lesser influence. I think it's a less important book. You, you did not mention, by the way, I've also written two novels, uh, one of which was commercially published, and you can, if you want to download for free the ebook of that, it's on the Bain Free Library. Uh, Bain Books. Jim Bain was the one publisher I know of who treated the internet as an opportunity rather than a threat. And so he's a, he's no longer alive, unfortunately, but he was a publisher who specialized in science fiction and fantasy and has some very good authors. And he published my first novel. And one of the things Bain does online is that at the point, they sell their books as ebooks as well as printed books, have for a long time. And when a book has been out long enough so they're not really making any substantial amount of money from it anymore. They put it up on the free library, partly on the theory that if readers get hooked on the free books, they may then go on to buy the books that aren't free. And so my first novel, Harold, is now up on the free library uh, at Bain, if anybody wants to read it. For people who like to listen to things while they drive, I actually taped podcasts of the whole book some years ago at my son's request. He said he'd rather listen to it than read it. Uh, and those are up. You can reach those from my webpage. Uh, my second novel was essentially self-published as a Kindle on Amazon, uh, and it's called uh, Salamander. Both of those were fun. Neither of them is libertarian propaganda, uh, but both of them are influenced by the fact that I'm both a libertarian and an economist, and I think that affects what I had to say in those in those novels. Yeah, I'm sure it does. Uh, I have... We're going to kind of start the questions off a little simpler, and we'll get a little bit more detailed as we go on with this. Garrett Lafferty wants me to ask you, uh, actually he has a statement and it leads to a question. He says, I'm having trouble grasping the concepts of macroeconomics in my university, but microeconomics was relatively simple to me, he says. As an individual who, who, as an individual who doesn't believe in the necessity of government spending or taxation, is it still possible to employ macroeconomic principles in a free market, or is macroeconomics solely based on government intervention through Keynesian principles? Yeah, well, the last statement has got to be false, because, of course, not all macroeconomists are Keynesian. Right. Uh, I share his general uh, difficulty with macro, that it's not what I do, and part of the reason I do it is that I don't have very good intuition for it, that I think what's called microeconomics and should be called price theory is a branch of economics that we actually understand pretty well. Uh, the reason macro and micro is misleading is that it sounds as though macro is about big things and micro is about small things. But the world wheat market is a microeconomics problem. It's, it's no different than the local wheat market in terms of the basic economics of it. So that's why it's a misleading way of putting it. Uh, but I would have said that what macroeconomics really deals with is disequilibrium that if you run through the microeconomics argument, there ought never to be involuntary unemployment, for example, because if the supply of labor is larger than the demand of labor, wages fall. As wages fall, the demand for labor goes up, and you end up with all workers who want to work being employed. That doesn't seem to be a fully accurate description of the real world. Therefore, you have the attempt by economists over a long period of time to work out a theory that would explain things like unemployment. Uh, inflation is usually also thought of as a macro phenomenon, although I'm not sure it real, that really is the sensible way of thinking of it. Uh, but certainly macroeconomics does not have to be Keynesian. Uh, and of course, Keynesianism covers a noticeable range of different, of different views. And I think it would be odd to say that macroeconomics only is relevant to what government does because it's relevant to understanding the world. Suppose you had a really good theory of macroeconomics, which let you make predictions about what would happen next year. Well, if you predict that uh, next year there will be high unemployment, that might be a good reason not to quit your job this year, for example. That would be an example of a perfectly private decision affected by your macroeconomics uh, predictions. Uh, so I guess, I guess the answer would be that, that, that I agree, to me at least, macro makes less sense than micro. Uh, the way I sometimes put it is that a course in macroeconomics is a tour of either a cemetery or a construction site. 
That is to say, there are past macro views which we have pretty re good reason to think are not correct, including the version of Keynesianism that was orthodox in the 1960s, which made various predictions that turned out not to be true. There are various attempts at building versions of macro, uh, but I don't think at this point there's anyone where you could say essentially everybody who's expert in the field agrees it's right. Uh, there was a couple of years ago, I noticed there was an interview with uh, Thomas Sargent, who had gotten the Nobel Prize for his work in macro a couple of years earlier. And he was responding to the claim Obama had made that all economists agreed the stimulus was the right thing to do. And Sargent said, I thought rather tactfully, that the president had been misinformed. Uh, I would have said the president is lying, but he was being uh, more polite than that. Uh, so Krugman, who supports the stimulus, thinks it should have been even bigger, has a Nobel Prize also, but his Nobel Prize is for work that has nothing to do with macroeconomics. His specialty was trade theory. Uh, so Sargent, in some sense, insofar as you believe in authorities, which I'm not sure I do, is a better authority than Krugman. <laughs> Uh, and his view, he didn't say that the stimulus was wrong. I think the point he was making was simply, it really is an open question uh, what one can do about, about things like this, and that Obama was trying to pretend it wasn't for obvious political reasons. Uh, so, so no, I think, I think macro is a hard problem. Uh, I think it is relevant whether you have a government or don't have a government. One implication of some macro theories is certain things governments ought to do, uh, but one could imagine using macro theories in a society without government to figure out what individuals could do because it's basically a theory explaining what's going to happen. Right. No, I completely agree with you. Uh, my next question comes from Lars Goren Anderson. He asks, uh, you know, now at this point in your life, how do you view the Chicago versus the Austrian argument and what school of economics do you believe is most correct? Yeah, I would consider myself a Chicago school economist. Uh, it's not, it isn't entirely clear how one defines these schools. So there is a version of the Austrian school, which I think is clearly wrong. Uh, but it's clearly wrong on methodological issues. This is the question basically of how you do economics. And there is a version of the Austrian school, which certainly not everybody considered Austrian would support, which holds that economics is essentially an a priori theory that you can't use uh, data or statistics or anything of that sort to find out what's true. You just start out with assumptions, with, 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 as it were, axioms about human action and deduce everything else from that. And I think that version, it seems to me, is clearly wrong. That I do not think there are any propositions that you can establish what will happen, that you can rigorously prove a priori. That is, if there are always, we don't have an a priori theory of what people want. And any behavior at all could be explained by a sufficiently bizarre theory of what people were trying to do. Uh, the way I put it in discussing that in my price theory book, I think, or maybe in Hidden Order, was uh, why is somebody standing on his head holding a burning $1,000 bill between his toes? Because he wants to stand on his head holding a burning $1,000 bill between his toes. So if you know nothing at all about what people want, you can't get any useful prediction of what they're going to do. Uh, on the other hand, people who have this view of the Austrian school also have what I think is a very inaccurate view of the alternative. That they, at least sometimes write, as if what the Chicago school is doing is pure empiricism. You just look at the data and it tells you what's true. And that's not, as far as I can tell, the way any Chicago school economist actually works. That the methodology of the Chicago School approach, as I understand it and practice it, is you form plausible conjectures on the grounds of the a priori argument. You use those conjectures to make predictions you can test in the real world. And you then believe or reject your conjecture or modify your conjecture according to what the real world evidence uh, tells you. Uh, so that my first published article in economics was an economic theory of the size and shape of nations. It was an attempt to explain certain general features of the map of Europe from the fall of the Roman Empire to the present. And I submitted it to the Journal of Political Economy, which was edited by George Stigler, 
who I had known since I was a small child. He was one of my father's best friends. And George rejected it. And he rejected it on the grounds that I had a theory but had no empirical tests of that theory. And he made some suggestions for how to test it, none of which worked. That is, none of which were doable. But I thought up some ways in which the theory actually gave you gave predictions that I could test by historical data. And I did it, and I resubmitted it, and the article was published. And I thought I learned something very interesting doing that. That not only did I now have a little bit of evidence my theory was right, I had also greatly improved the theory. Because if you ask yourself, what real-world implications does this theory have, that forces you to think through more clearly than you had done before exactly what you're saying, exactly what is the theory, in order to find out what its implications are. Uh, and that's, that's sort of, in a certain sense, my first professional work in economics. Uh, I was sort of pleased a few years ago. I noticed that somebody had a sort of summary of the history of economic work on the problem of size of nations. And the literature on that consists, first, of my article, second of an article by Jim Buchanan, who was a Nobel Prize winner ten years later, and then at least one book by somebody at Harvard and some other people years later than that. So I thought that was sort of work I was rather happy with, that I'd seen an interesting problem. I think I have a at least partly correct explanation of why nations were small at certain times and large at other times, and it would not have been as good work if I had thought that just a priori arguments were enough and hadn't tried to figure out how, how I would test that theory in the real world. But now, having said all of that, I think it's clear that not everybody who considers himself an Austrian would take the extreme a prioriistic version. And there's another area where there's a disagreement between people who call themselves Austrians and people who call themselves Chicago on macroeconomics, having to do with different theories of business cycles. That's not an area I'm competent to judge. It's not a field I've myself worked in. Uh, I, I know that my father's view, because that was his field, was that, as best I remember, that the Austrian view of business cycles was logically possible but was inconsistent with the evidence on what had actually happened with business cycles. And whether that's right, I don't know. As I say, it's not my field. And there are other distinctions. That is, I think you have a hard time getting a really clear definition of what the schools are, except this set of people over here and that set of people over there. Uh, but I think part of what's going on uh, with some of the more extreme Austrians is they have the, I'm thinking now of libertarians. Of course, neither school is inherently libertarian, although some people will claim it is. Uh, von Mises, who is, I suppose, the most important figure in the Austrian school, uh, in one of his books, uh, explicitly came out uh, in favor of the draft and of, uh, in, in favor of conscription. Uh, I believe he also came out in favor of government subsidies to opera, if I remember correctly. Uh, he was, after all, an Austrian in the literal sense, <laughs> Austria. Uh, so he was, I would say, more libertarian than most contemporary economists, uh, less libertarian than hardcore libertarians are at the moment. Uh, I'm an anarchist and I'm Chicago school. Uh, so I don't think you can easily uh, make a political distinction between the two. And I think part of what's going on is product differentiation. Yeah. That if you're an economist, especially a libertarian economist, and you observe that the rest of the world pays attention to the Chicago School economists who are libertarians, but not to you, one way of explaining it is, ah, but that's because the Chicago School people are sellouts who accept the conventional view of economics, and only we have the truth. I think that's not a very useful, useful approach. Uh, but there certainly are economists in the Austrian tradition who are good economists. I mean, I think Mises, as far as I can tell, was a good economist, even if I disagree with his methodology. And there are the earlier uh, Austrian economists who started it uh, uh, had a somewhat different approach than Marshall, who's really the person from whose work the Chicago School ultimately descends, I think. Uh, but uh, they were they were good economists too. Yeah, no, good, good answer. Um, this is really, <laughs> I'm learning a lot here too. Usually, I'm the one educating other people on on topics, but uh, this is good stuff. Uh, I have a, a question from Francesco Principi, uh, Prin Principi, excuse me. Do, do you trust in fiat currencies? What are your thoughts about fractional reserve banking, and how does it, you know, how how could a free society yep. have have currency and medium of exchange? 
Yeah, I don't think fiat currency is the best form of currency. On the other hand, I will be surprised if the dollar has a hyperinflation at any time in the next few years. So I think fiat currency has been working tolerably well, if not as well as some alternatives might work. Uh, once in a while, fiat currency goes very badly wrong. The famous German hyperinflation before between, a little after World War I, there was a Hungarian hyperinflation. Zimbabwe had hyperinflation pretty recently. So it's fiat currencies have the potential to go wrong very badly. They have the obvious advantage that you don't have to dig any gold out of the ground in order to provide them, so they're in that sense a cheaper way of, of, of doing currency. Uh, my preferred version of currency would be private banks issuing fractional reserve currency. Uh, the argument in favor of a fractional reserve system is that it's a way of making it necessary for the issuer to maintain the value of the money. And it's a less expensive way of doing that than a 100% reserve system. So the basic logic of a fractional reserve system, let me take a real example, namely the private banking in Scotland in the 18th century when Adam Smith was writing. Uh, the banks are issuing banknotes, which are defined in terms of silver. That is, the note in effect says, we will pay you one-tenth of an ounce of silver on demand. I don't remember what the units were, but it was something like that. The bank, let us say, issues notes for a million ounces of silver. And in the process of doing this, it buys 100,000 ounces of silver. So it actually has in its vault one ounce for every 10 ounces it owes. But the rest of it, it has as other assets. All right, it's printed the money, it gets stuff with it. So it buys interest-bearing assets with the rest. Now, people say, ah, oh, but what if people want their silver? It's not there. But that's all right. If people want their silver, as people bring in the notes and get the bank silver, the bank sells the other assets, buys silver out on the market, and thus can keep replenishing its supply of silver. Uh, so it's not the case that the bank is making promises it can't fulfill. Now, it's true it is making promises it can't be positive it will fulfill, in that you can imagine a situation where the price of silver goes up a whole lot compared to other assets, and the bank now no longer is able to fulfill its obligations. But that's true of essentially all firms that make any promises that an insurance company won't be able to pay off if all the houses happen to burn down the same year. Uh, a company that borrows money from you might go bankrupt. Uh, so that the, in that respect, the... Uh, fractional reserve banking is no more dishonest uh, than any any other firm. And as long as it tells the truth about the situation, it's not dishonest at all. And in fact, uh, one of the things that some of the banks did in Scotland in the 18th century was to have on their notes what was referred to as an option clause. And what the option clause said was, we agree to pay you a tenth of an ounce of silver on demand. If we can't, if there's a run on the bank and we run out, we agree that we will pay you a year later with the following extra amount to compensate you for the wait. I don't remember what the numbers were. So in that case, they were making it perfectly explicit that there was a potential problem, and I don't see, therefore, any, any moral problem. Uh, and in the case of the Scots banks, they took a additional precaution, and that was that the banks were unlimited liability partnerships, and normally one of the partners would be a wealthy nobleman. So that meant that even if something went wrong with the bank and it, it ran out of money, the partner was still obliged to pay the bank's obligations because it wasn't limited liability. And since he had very large assets, it was very unlikely that the bank would ultimately be unable to, to pay off. So that's a fractional reserve system. What's the advantage of that against a 100% reserve system, which is one where for every note out there, you've got the silver in your vault? And the answer is that a 100% reserve bank has no way of paying its bills. That is to say, since it has no revenue source, because it's had to spend all of the money that it printed buying the silver it's using as a reserve. So therefore, such a bank would have to, in some form or another, charge people for using its money. So if you imagine that the money is not paper notes, but a checking account, you could have a checking account, 
where the bank says, yes, indeed, for every ounce of silver in your checking account, there is a bar of silver sitting in our vault. But we're going to pay you, charge you 2% a year for having your checking account because we've got to have money to pay our rent and pay our employees and so forth. Whereas the fractional reserve system, the bank, for every uh, 10 ounces out there, the bank has 9 ounces, in my example, of interest-bearing assets that it bought with the money, and those assets pay it. And in fact, depending on the cost of running a bank, the checking account with the fractional reserve bank could pay interest. And some, of course, checking accounts do pay interest, even in our system. Now, our system, our fractional reserve banks, the reserve is not silver, it's ultimately paper money printed by the government. So it's our system is crazy, as it happens, because the function of, economically speaking, of the fractional reserve, as opposed to the 100% reserve, is that it's a way of economizing on the reserve assets, since right. you can do it with a tenth as much silver as you would. But our system, the asset we're economizing on, is one that costs nothing to produce, namely paper money. So we have a fractional reserve system in a fiat system where fractional reserves serve no useful function. But if you imagine a system of private competing banks, now it would make a great deal of sense to have some commodity. Uh, my ideal version of this, you don't use silver. Uh, the trouble with a silver standard or a gold standard, even with a fractional reserve system, is that if something that happens in the outside world unpredictably changes the value of silver or gold, you have suddenly changed the value of all long-term contracts. So imagine that I'm borrowing money to buy a house and we define my obligation in, in monetary units which are defined in silver and something happens that makes silver much more valuable. My debt has just doubled. Yeah. Right? Something happens that makes silver much less valuable. The bank has just lost a lot of money because the value of my debt has dropped in half. So that's not a very sensible system. Now, it's not a terrible system because silver and gold don't change that rapidly. But if you look, especially at the history of gold, uh, what actually happened was that uh, from, I think, about 1880 to 1900, gold was a deflationary currency. That is, the value of gold was going up. Because not a lot of gold was being mined, the economies were growing, so the demand for money was go growing, and more countries were going on the gold standard. Somewhere in the late 19th century, two important things happened to change that. One of them was the discovery of gold in South Africa, and the other was a new technology for refining gold from low-grade grade ore using cyanide. And the result was that gold switched from being a deflationary metal to being an inflationary metal. Now, it wasn't a very inflationary metal by our standards. Uh, it's not like, you know, price didn't double every year or anything. But it was inflationary enough so that it meant that long-term people had signed long-term contracts both before and after were in effect having the terms of the contract changed on them uh, by accident, by the, by the change in the gold market. So the ideal system, from my standpoint, uses what's referred to as a commodity bundle. That when my bank goes into existence, we say, if you bring in a million Friedman dollars, we will give you uh, a ton of grade A steel plus 500 bushels of grade B wheat, plus two ounces of gold, plus you would have some list of commodities, and the bundle is what you would redeem. You only redeem it for large amounts of money because it's not practical to give a bundle for one dollar because it would be a grain of, e a grain of wheat and, and so forth. And now, since it's very unlikely that, the, that all of those different commodities will change their price at the same time, you have something which is more stable, which gives you a more consistent, predictable value for the money than any single commodity. So I think, theoretically speaking, that's the best system that, that I can think of. Uh, on the other hand, if you actually had private fractional reserve banking, it's probably more likely you would use something like silver or gold, because that's a simpler system and easier to get established. No. The other thing you would like to have with a system of competing banks, and you had in the Scottish case, is that they all use the same standard. Because that way, unless a bank is seriously shaky, all the money exchanges at one for one. And that makes it easier to do transactions. You don't really care very much who, who printed your, your, your money as long as it's a trustworthy bank and as long as they all use the same standard. So that's a long answer.
<laughs> if people are curious about it on the Cato site, there's an old article of mine which is called something like gold, silver, or paper, in which what I'm arguing there is that the critical question is not whether you have a uh, silver money or a gold money or a paper money. The critical question is <laughs> what the incentives are of whoever is issuing the money. And that the argument for competing private banks is that they have an incentive to maintain the value of their money, to use a money that will be stable, not to inflate it, whereas government issuers have a variety of perverse incentives. And under some circumstances, it's in the interest of the government to deliberately inflate the money, some circumstances not. So I'm really arguing that the critical question is who issues it and what are the incentives of the people issuing it, not how do they do it. Just as the critical question for farming is not do you grow corn or wheat, it is do you have private uh, people, private firms, private farmers deciding what to grow, or do you have collectivized agriculture uh, a la the Soviet Union? And that that's the real question. And then if you have the private system, it will be the incentive of the private actors to figure out what's the best crop to grow. No, I completely agree with you. And for a while, I've actually been trying to point out the fact that fractional reserve banking can be voluntary and, and done privately. Uh, you know, some people just attack fractional reserve banking because it's usually negatively correlated with the, the system that might be today, and they, they can't see a, a private, you know, currency system or competing currencies. So, you know, fractional, what I always tell people is, you know, if you want 100% reserve, it's called a safety deposit box, you know? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. no, that, that, that's essentially right. And, yeah. and that... that in a free, I would predict at least that if you had a free market for money, that the fractional reserve banking would simply drive the 100% reserve banking off the market because the 100% reserve banking, think about it in checking accounts, which is the easiest case. Right. And the 100% reserve banking would be charging you interest on your checking account and the fractional reserve banking would be paying you interest on your checking account and people would prefer the latter. In both cases, you have to trust the bank in some sense, because after all, the 100% reserve bank says it's 100% reserve, but if they're really villains, they have smuggled all the gold out, you know, to somewhere else, and then the bank crashes. Similarly, the fractional reserve bank could do the same thing. So in both cases, you need institutions by which people are watching the banks in which people will know if something uh, suspicious is going on. So you don't really solve that problem. And the fractional reserve bank involves some small risk that the uh, value of its non-reserve assets will go down relative to its reserve assets and it'll go bust. That risk can be largely covered, as I was suggesting in the Scottish case, by having the bank have other assets in addition to its banking assets. You can imagine some firm with a, lot of, w w with a large market capitalization also issues money, and so even if the money issuing goes bad, they've still got an extra $20 billion backing them, as it were. Uh, so I don't see any particular reason not to trust a private fractional reserve bank. Uh, and as I say, I think there are obvious reasons why that's what you would get on a, on a free market. Yeah, well, let's move on. Um, this actually it still has to tie, ties in with monetary policy, um, but I guess it's kind of outside monetary policy. Ethan Urkelishan wants me to ask you, is Bitcoin a solution to the federal funny money we have today? Is it the future or an ill-conceived experiment? That's a very interesting question. I think I would have to understand Bitcoin better than I do to make a, an answer. It is clearly a very ingenious experiment. It's a second best, uh, from my standpoint, because it is the equivalent of a 100% reserve currency of a bizarre sort, in the sense that generating a dollar's worth of bitcoins actually cost you about a dollar's worth of computer power, as I understand how it works. So in that sense, it's like a private 100% reserve gold standard, except that its version of gold is bits of information which are mined by computer processing. Uh, it's a very ingenious idea. It has one very large advantage over all of the alternatives, and that is that it does not, as I understand it, require a trusted bank that what I've been arguing in favor of for many years would be a fully anonymous e-cash. And you can describe pretty easily how, if you have a bank somewhere that's willing to issue it, you could create an e-cash where I can make a payment to you by sending you information such that 
I don't have to know who you are, only how to get information to you. You don't have to know who I am. And the bank that's ultimately holding the money doesn't have to ever know who either of us is. And the mathematics for doing that was worked out by a Dutch cryptographer called David Chaum, I suppose, 20 or 30 years ago, maybe more by now. Uh, it still doesn't exist. Uh, that would be, from my standpoint, the ideal system with private competing issuers. And the fundamental problem with doing that is that a number of governments, including the U.S., very, very much don't want you to do it. Because if there is a fully anonymous e-cash, now money laundering laws become unenforceable. Right. Because you can now make secret transfers to people. Now, I don't, I don't entirely disagree with the government. Because if you have a fully anonymous e-cash, kidnapping becomes a more practical uh, crime. Because one way in which you catch kid kidnappers is when you pay them off. And with fully anonymous e-cash, the kidnapper just tells you how to get the e-cash to him. There's no way of tracing it, so therefore kidnapping would be more of a problem in that world. Not everything governments do is bad. Some of the things government do, do like trying to prevent kidnapping uh, or murder for hire would be another example of the same thing, uh, is worth doing. I, I have a discussion of what the world looks like with fully deployed public key uh, cryptography, including anonymous e-cash. Uh, and it includes my business plan for Murder Incorporated, the description of how you could have uh, essentially hitmen sold on the marketplace, which is a, a bad thing to happen. On the other hand, it also would drastically reduce the power of government. Governments, I think, do a lot more damage than private criminals at present, so therefore I think on net it's a win. But in any case, given that the U.S. government has good reasons to oppose it, and that in order to do it, you have to have a bank in some country reliable enough so that people will trust it to pay off on its promises, that means that the government can make it very hard to do it, can pressure other countries, and it's not only the U.S. government, the U.S. would be the, the, the largest player, as it were. So, so far, no private bank is issued. It. And the beauty of bitcoins is that it doesn't require a private bank. In that sense, it's, an, it's a sort of online equivalent to a money that consists of gold coins. And for a gold coin money, you don't need a trusted issuer. All you need is some way of testing the coin to make sure it's really gold. So it's sort of the cyber equivalent of that. It's a very ingenious idea. I don't understand the mechanism and the mathematics of it well enough. I've had one person who understood it try to explain it to me, but we only spent half an hour or so, and it's a fairly complicated system. So I'm not sure whether that particular one works or not. Okay. But it's a very interesting idea because at the cost of you having to actually use up computer resources to produce your money, it produces a form of private currency which doesn't require a trusted issuer. And that's a very desirable feature. Yeah. So yeah. that's as much as I think I'm willing to say on Bitcoin. <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. Maybe, maybe the next time I have you on my show, you uh, will look into the subject a little bit more. We can talk about maybe. that then. Um, l l l I have a question from Cheryl Lowry, my wife. Uh, she asks... What are some of the larger political and economical disagreements that you had with your father when he was still alive? I don't think I had any economic agreements, strictly speaking. Uh, I described how a society would work without government. And my view was that such a society would probably work but might not. And his view was that it might work but would probably not work. So that's a disagreement, but it's not a very large disagreement. I don't think either of us would claim that you could prove it, that we don't have good... In, we have economic theories of political institutions. That's what's called public choice theory. But they aren't developed nearly far enough, I think, to be able to say with confidence uh, exactly what will work or how likely it is to work. Uh, the most important criticism I got of my ideas was actually not from my father, but from Jim Buchanan, who was a colleague of mine at VPI for some years, and who was one of the people who invented public choice theory originally. And he pointed out a problem with my argument, uh, which was a real problem. And I'm, cur I, you can find talks of mine online where I discuss the problem, what I think my solution is, and that's one of the things that will go into the third edition of Machinery of Freedom when I get around the finishing the third edition is trying to answer Jim's legitimate critique of my arguments on the economics of anarchy, essentially. But I wouldn't say that I had any really substantial uh, political disagreements. Now, it's true, I concluded that drugs should be legal 
probably a decade or two before my father reached that conclusion. So that was a disagreement for a while, but he eventually came around and agreed with that particular conclusion. Uh, but I can't really think of any major issues that I would say we, we, we disagreed with uh, on that kind of line. No, no, very informative. In fact, it was, it was kind of funny you brought up Machinery of Freedom because Logan Hoy asks, when are you going to finish the third edition of Machinery yep. of Freedom? That was the next question. Yep. <laughs> sure. Uh, as some people may know, because I've discussed it before, this is partly a copyright issue. That the usual arrangement for publishing books is that the publisher controls the copyright as long as he keeps the book in print. And the second edition was published with open court publishers. And it is not clear whether or not they have kept the book in print because the contract was signed quite a long time ago and publishing technology has changed since then. So the actual situation with the book is that there was a period of, I think, several years when it was available only as print on demand. So that if you wanted to buy a copy of the book, you basically asked Open Court, and they would agree that sometime in the next two months they would give you a copy of the book. And I actually received a correspondence from somebody who got one of those copies, and according to him, it was not the same quality of, of print, of, of physical object, as the mass publication version had been. So the question is, was it in print? If it was out of print, then I'm supposed to get the copyright back. If it was in print, I'm not. <laughs> I would be happy to have Open Court publish the third edition if they wanted to. As far as I can tell, and I may be out of date on this, the problem with Open Court is not that they don't want to publish it or don't want to give you my copyright back, but that they've had sufficient problems so they're not making decisions very well at the moment. And I would be happy to have my copyright back and to find another publisher. I'd be happy to have them publish it. My uh, current plan, if none of those things happen, is that I will simply do the third edition as a new part five of the book. If you look at the first and second edition, I made very few changes to the first edition when I did the second. What I did was simply to add a new part four with a bunch of new material. And my fallback position on the third edition is that I will simply finish all of my chapters for part five, which I've written drafts of, I think most or all of at this point, and I will put part five up on my web page to be downloaded by anybody who wants. You can then download parts one through four from my web page because it's already there. I got open court's permission to do that some time ago. Uh, and you can then assemble your very own third edition. But I would rather actually print it as a single coherent book and possibly by the time I'm finished, I will have persuaded open court to let me do that. <laughs> well, we can only hope so, right? Well, hey, uh, I, I want, I was, you know, we're running out of time here. Uh, kind of the last question, or actually comments or statements from you is give out your website, you know, some other information that you'd like for people to see, you know, it's your turn to plug. Sure. And also, give like a two-minute summary of what you'd like people to hear before we, before we, you know, head on out of here tonight. Sure. My website is www.daviddfriedman.com. So that's pretty easy. I also have a blog, and if you go to the website, there is a link to the blog at the top of the website, which is the easiest way to find it. The website has got most of my books on it to be read for free, and most of my articles on it to be read for free. That I write books not mainly as a source of income, but mainly as a way of spreading ideas. And the web is a tolerable technology for selling information, but a wonderful technology for giving information away. So anytime my publisher will let me, uh, with one exception, uh, I put my book up uh, on the web for free, and that way people can read it. And not only can they read it for free, they can find it without looking for it. Because one of the nice things about putting things on the web is someone is doing a Google search on some subject, and they discover a book they didn't know existed and read it. So <laughs> if you go to my website, you can read uh, lots. Uh, you can read, I suppose, about four or five of my books. I'm not sure the exact count at the moment. You can read lots and lots of my academic articles. You can read a fair number of my libertarian essays of various sorts. Uh, if you're curious, one of my long-term hobbies is cooking from very old cookbooks uh, back to about the 10th century. So you can one of the things you can find on my webpage, I didn't mention, there are two books that I co-authored with my wife and self-published. 
uh, one of which is a large collection of medieval and Renaissance recipes, giving the original and our worked out version. That's one of my hobbies. You can find a bunch of other stuff about my related hobbies on the website. Uh, I hope you will read my novels. Uh, in particular, I hope you will comment on my novels because the main payoff I've gotten for my second novel is reviews on Amazon, some of which are by perceptive readers who encourage me to feel that the book worked because passages were read the way they're supposed to be read. I particularly like somebody in England to put a comment on Amazon on my second novel because it has no comments on the UK Amazon, although it's got about 11, almost all of them very positive, on the US Amazon. Uh, what else is to say? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, there's a whole lot to, to be said. Uh, I don't think of myself as a professional libertarian. I think I'm a professional economist. I have some reservations about the profession of being a professional libertarian because it sort of obliges you to reach the libertarian conclusion whether or not the arguments for it are best, whereas I would prefer to try to follow the strategy of figuring out what's true, and most of the time it fits my political views, and once in a while it doesn't. <laughs> That was amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. I'm going to try and have you back on, hopefully within the next two months. How's that sound? That's fine with me. I gather you have a new baby, so you may discover that some of your plans get uh, disrupted <laughs> by a uh, third force uh, intervening and demanding a lot of your time. Definitely, especially since it's my first. It's a, it's a big lesson. So <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for being on the right. show. I'm going to, I'll, see you, I'll talk to you soon. Right. Bye-bye. Thanks for checking out Triple V today, guys. As you know, I have an interview every single day with a new voluntarist, libertarian, or anarcho-capitalist, or non-aggressionist that's trying to advance the message of freedom. If you know somebody who'd like to be on my show, please have them contact me at shanklinmike at yahoo.com or over on my Facebook page. It's not hard to find me over at Michael Shanklin on Facebook. You can also find me over at Mike Shanklin on YouTube as well. Um, and don't forget to check out Voluntary Virtues. As always, these videos and interviews are free for everyone out there, but we have to eat. We have to uh, pay some bills. So if you could donate a dollar, two dollars, five dollars over at VoluntaryVirtues.com, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for your time, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.